Hey, welcome everybody to our session on uh, managing geopolitical risk. Uh, my name is uh, Francis Shortkin, and I have the uh, privilege of uh, chairing this uh, panel. And I'm joined with uh, five uh, experts who are going to uh, help us understand some of the, uh, the dynamics and the landscape of, uh, of geopolitical risk. I will take a few minutes to just very briefly introduce the, the topic. Um, I don't think anybody would really need an introduction to the topic. We, we all are very well aware of the, uh, the dynamics, the challenges of geopolitical risk, especially in today's environment, not only because of uh, COVID-19, and how it has impacted uh, the geopolitical and the geoeconomic landscape and how it has reshaped supply chain risks and so on, or the conflict in uh, Ukraine and how the Russian invasion has put geopolitical risk probably more on the radar screen of uh, companies these days. Uh, we also want to you know, consider how business leaders might be or may not be in a position to adequately manage geopolitical risk uh, so they face challenges in terms of boosting their corporate resilience uh, to survive in an environment that is defined by rising geopolitical risks. And we want to look at whether or not there are any avenues, any strategies that uh, business leaders could pursue to circumvent geopolitical tensions. In other words, to, to sort of mitigate geopolitical risks or avoid them altogether if that is uh, uh, possible. So these are just some of the, the broad outlines of our topic. Um, and um, I'm um, pleased to be joined by uh, five uh, experts to uh, help us clarify uh, these uh, topics. And I'll go in order of how they were listed in the, uh, in the program. And the format will be that everybody talks for about four minutes, uh, give a general introduction to the topic. Once we have gone through all five uh, panelists, I might come back with some uh, broad questions to get us started. And then at any point, anybody in the audience, I see we have about three people right now, certainly can feel free to grab the mic and then ask a question as well. So first off, I would like to introduce uh, Thomas Amond uh, Laritas, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Highgate, and he's joining us from the United Kingdom. So, Thomas, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Francis. And uh, actually, I happen to be in Portugal today, but uh, that doesn't change much. Uh, so, I, I, I'll be I'll be very brief. I, uh, I think that since uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, there had been uh, an assumption that geopolitical risk is something that corporations and governments needed to address when it comes to the emerging markets. Uh, and I think for the last few years, there has been a massive wake-up call that geopolitical risk concerns also uh, the Western world, including the heart of Europe. And I think the first wake-up call was uh, with the Brexit, where we saw that it had a, a massive impact uh, uh, on cooperation and governments in the way they uh, forecast the risk uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and if you look at the evolution of uh, the British pound, uh, a few economists have been saying that actually it follows the pattern of an emerging market currency. Uh, um, now, obviously, the... Uh, an even bigger wake-up call is the war taking place now between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and, uh, and this is impacting uh, most uh, international corporations throughout the world, either because they had operations in Russia and didn't uh, forecast the fact that uh, uh, they may run into problems, uh, but even those not operating in the region, we see uh, their repercussions uh, uh, on the bottom line uh, globally. And uh, we are now entering into a phase where we are seeing uh, the impact of uh, the new wave of COVID in uh, Shanghai, also impacting the global economy. So between the first wave of COVID till now, the Brexit and uh, uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine, we see that it is now becoming 
the kind of things that any CEO needs to look at uh, uh, much more seriously than before. And it is not just a question of uh, how does it impact your operations in emerging markets, but it's also how it impacts your operations in, uh, in the West. And uh, very few corporations were, for example, looking at uh, the start of the pandemic in 2020 and thinking this may have an impact uh, on their activities. So um, I think the, uh, uh, the consequences is uh, corporations need to be in a mood of monitoring geopolitical situation in a much more proactive way than they used to do. Uh, they also need to do some scenario planning in a way that uh, they forgot to do. Uh, if you want to sign a deal with the uh, with a Russian businessman, are we sure that there's not a risk that within two years or four years time, this person might not end up on a sanction list? Of course, now everybody's thinking about that. But until the 24th of February, very few people were actually thinking in these terms. And it's not just cooperation. Take the example of the government of Germany, which is importing 40% of its gas from Russia. And a lot of people have been telling the German government this is an issue. And the gov German government has been pretending that this was not an issue. That it was just commercial relationship, forgetting that the issue of energy security uh, uh, can have a very wide impact on their economy. Uh, and I think we're seeing also a movement from, uh, on, on managing your supply chain from passing to a model of just in time to just in case. Uh, and of course, this comes at a higher cost, but it is a question of investing in potentially in mitigating potential geopolitical risk that may come down the road. So I think we're seeing a massive wake up call for the last few years. Again, Brexit, COVID, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, and realizing that geopolitical uh, uh, issues have an impact, not just in emerging market, but also in what are usually considered stable Western markets. All right, thank you, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, next, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Sandro Geiken, who is the founder of Monarch, uh, uh, based out of uh, Germany. Sandro, the floor is all yours. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So um, I'm, I'm coming from um, the intelligence world. Um, uh, Monarch is a private intelligence company, and um, uh, I've been working in that field for quite some time. So um, it's interesting to watch the uh, world change from that perspective. And I think the, the, the most interesting thing right now and what we're looking at and the intelligence community largely is looking at is uh, not what is happening at the moment, which, of course, is interesting on a, on a tactical level, um, but what will happen next? So what will happen after COVID and after Ukraine? Because that's going to be the, the longer period, the longer time and the more uh, difficult uh, time ahead. And um, there are a few things actually which we believe will happen and uh, which we believe will um, stay there as very explicit and very demanding problems. So one, for instance, is that there will be a more explicit gap between authoritarian and democratic countries. Of course, we all knew that this gap existed uh, mainly between the West and uh, Russia and China, but uh, we were able to... Um, uh, ignore it uh, for the time being because relations were good, everything looked fine, uh, people were happy. Um, but now we're seeing this gap uh, very strongly and we're seeing it wide. Um, another consequence, of course, will be that the Iron Curtain will be back and uh, it will be quite strong. So it will be an age, uh, at least for the relations between Russia and the West. Uh, China is still undecided where to go with this. Uh, but at least between Russia and the West, uh, there will be a, f a, f a fall back into the 80s. So there will be a lot of espionage, there will be sabotage. And uh, let's not forget that global nuclear war uh, is back as an option. So we are no nobody's considering that to be very likely at the moment. Um, but at least it's, it's back on the table. So this is something that's not uh, pure theory anymore. And um, that's a bad news because we, we, we're very ill prepared for that being back on the table. So we're, nobody has been talking even about nuclear strategy uh, for two decades. Um, so all these things are back, uh, old, old games, so to speak, but uh, they have a new twist 
to them as well. So when you're now uh, calling up these old uh, um, cold soldiers, uh, we call them from the Cold War, um, they turn out to be pretty useless because uh, their strategic mindset is still in tanks and planes and uh, nuclear weapons, but a lot has changed. Um, and a lot will continue to change. So the, the one thing that you all will know better than I do is that the global economic order uh, will change quite a bit. We're seeing that currently with the supply chain. We're seeing new topics coming up like digital sovereignty. Uh, China just decided to kick all out all foreign IT out of the country. Uh, there are similar um, engagements in other areas. And energy security will also be high on the agenda. And this time with an impact, not just an academic <coughs> record. Um, so that's a new thing. Uh, China is definitely another new thing in this new Cold War. China is big. China will be more outspoken in its demands. And uh, it may actually, that's an interest, maybe an interesting animation for you. It may nibble at the Russian borders. Uh, China is quite interested in getting its hands on Siberia and uh, already has uh, what they call minor settlements, but what are de facto uh, millions uh, of people in, in their own Chinese cities with Chinese guards in the middle of Russia. Uh, so they're already beginning to colonize and will use, may probably abuse a weak Russia uh, to colonize Russia further. And they will be more outspoken uh, geopolitically. So they want to be a strong geostrategic actor. They will be more cautious now with Taiwan that they've now that they've seen that the democratic states unite very quickly and very unanimously in case of a crisis, even if they seem to be undivided uh, most of the times. Um, but they will demand center stage in the future. And then more importantly, and this is a field where I am uh, and, and my company are having a lot of expertise, uh, there are all these new kinds of intelligence operations, the hybrid operation types. So we have cyber operations, uh, which you can conduct, uh, which is new in comparison to the Cold War. Uh, we have information operations, disinformation, fake news, where you can do a lot. And we have, uh, more importantly, also economic operations. Um, economic operations are very likely fallout of the current crisis because uh, you can use that as a state uh, in a combination of cyber and information operations um, to rebuild your economy. So a very common type of attack here, for example, is short and distort attacks, um, where you're just uh, running short attacks after uh, disseminating bad news and uh, then, then betting on falling stocks. Uh, we're having all, all sorts of other cyber-enabled stock market manipulations, which we've seen already, which are very rarely detected, very hard to detect, and even harder to bring to court, and uh, which are pretty much impossible to um to, to confront at the moment. So there's a lot of new things in this new world order. In addition, random civilian actors like hacktivists can have an impact. And we believe that the, the coming age, the next Cold War, will be a very dangerous combustible mix, uh, which is growing up there. And there's another important twist. Um, and this is something that uh, many of you may not know so very well. Um, but we are not good at this game anymore. So during the Cold War, we had all sorts of strategists. We had militaries. We had very capable intelligence uh, communities. Um, but now we suffered, uh, so to speak, from uh, decades of deep peace, and they all fell asleep. So I can tell you that uh, from my talks, for example, with militaries, the, the funniest one I had was uh, a lieutenant colonel telling me, oh, this war in Ukraine is a huge administrative problem. Um, because uh, there was all of a sudden there was so much changing and they, they, they are used to administer things and not to actually go to war and think in terms of security. So that's a military and deep peace is mainly with administration and politics. Um, but actually going to war and doing things uh, with a gun in your hand, that's uh, pretty much out of scope for many of them. And the same goes for intelligence uh, communities. They've been underfunded, they have an administrative mindset, and they're not up to their game. And one simple example is cyber operations. So all of you may think that our, our uh, militaries and intelligence communities have huge cyber uh, troops uh, going into everything, capable of hacking everything. But a single good hacker costs and on the open market, uh, starts at 300,000 annual salary and goes up to 1.2 million annual salary. And no military or intelligence community is able to afford that. Uh, so accordingly, they have a few, like literally a handful or two handful of um, uh, loyal loyal fighters in their ranks, uh, who we have to rank uh, very highly and who I am always very grateful for. Um, but the rest is not so great. 
And they're also not so good at buying technologies rapidly, which you have to do. So procurement still takes 24 to 36 months. So we're not up to the up to the game in this uh, in this thing, and uh, we're also not really having a plan. So this is also something many civilians and lay people think that in politics or in military or intelligence community, somebody understands this and somebody has a plan. I must unfortunately uh, uh, shatter that illusion. Nobody has a plan, and nobody really knows what's going on or what's to do next. Um, so this has a lot of implication, I think, for the private sector. So you will need very good foresight. Uh, you will need strategy. You will have to incorporate geostrategic movements and changes. And you will need much better risk management. Uh, and you will have to pay this by yourself and not rely on government actors. And I think that's my four minutes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I would invite uh, Nicholas Johnson, uh, CEO of Economists Without Borders uh, from Australia, uh, to share his thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to touch on three geopolitical risks, which I believe have been understated or neglected, um, acknowledging there are many risks which um, will be discussed today. Uh, and the first of these is the extent to which we don't have sufficient redundancy in our digital systems. Um, and what do I mean by this? Uh, we have become very reliant on digital systems to store information, to communicate. But to give you an example, once every 150 years, we have a significant solar flare event, which will cause havoc. Last time this occurred, all it did was interrupt some, some Morse codes being sent um, via telegraph. Um, another example, if there is space debris, which knocks out a satellite, um, a significant portion of the world will lose internet. Um, we need sufficient... Um, redundant systems in place to be able to maintain um, core activities in our society. Um, uh, and there's not enough focus on that. Um, the second risk I'd like to talk about is the exposure we have to what I would describe as recklessness in certain cryptocurrency markets. Um, and don't get me wrong, I believe that blockchain and cryptocurrencies are going to play an integral part of bringing about many great things. Uh, but to give you one, one such, such example, um, I am doubtful as to whether certain stable coins have a one-to-one -one, uh, reserve, as they claim. And given that substantial amounts of the price in large cryptocurrencies um, is backed up by the stable coins, I think there's a great exposure to risk there, which we re really need to be careful to navigate. And quickly, the third geopolitical risk, which I think we need to be careful for, especially in the next year and a half to two years, is the rising interest rates driven by the strong inflation environment, environment which we see. And this is combined, this is brought about by a classic combination of a supply shock caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, Chinese lockdowns, um, ongoing supply chain issues, as well as the expansionary fiscal policy which we've seen coming out of COVID. And so we have this sort of stagflationary environment, which is reminiscent of the, the 1970s. And I think um, uh, household debt in particular in many uh, uh, countries is, is higher than usual and um, they're going to be at risk of, of a recession with the rising interest rates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we have Dimas Dennis uh, Manginas, uh, who's Managing Director of Manginas and Associates uh, from uh, Greece. Oh, Dimas, you, you muted. Okay, sorry. I'm back. So, um, I believe that uh, for the last uh, 25 years now, we are facing uh, a planet as a body. So, it's uh, this globalization brought us to a single body. So, uh, as a friend was telling me a few years ago, if your uh, thumb hurts, your body hurts. It's the same thing. <laughs> you know, the geopolitical risks cannot be, uh, you know, uh, we can identify symptoms, but they are impacting all over the world now. So the biggest, uh, the biggest surprise that I have ever seen is after the, this invasion uh, to Ukraine, the prices 
of uh, electricity, natural gas, oil and gas, everything went up. And so the, the production cost went up and everything went up just from a 70 days war between two countries and uh, in their neighborhood, in fact. And you can see now that the interconnection of everyone with every source of energy, of, of, wo of wealth, it is that big that we cannot uh, bypass it. Le let me give you a, a, small, uh, a small risk or big risk for this year. What is the future of our planet after the elections in China? That's the, that's the biggest question for me. You know, everybody's talking about what will happen with Taiwan and is there going to be war there or what? And all of a sudden you see that everything stopped because there are elections coming. <coughs> we have uh, something that it is uh, the, the, the gold agenda of the Europeans used to be uh, preserve the climate and our planet. And you can see all of a sudden in one day, we say yes to lignite, yes to uh, nuclear power plants, yes to everything in order to uh, abort this inflation coming uh, in our economy. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seen something, uh, you know, that it is uh, very uh, scary. Uh, it is uh, after two years, of COVID pandemic uh, crisis here in Europe and in the United States, all of a sudden China has appeared having the same problem. Even though it started from China, all of a sudden there were peace there, there was nothing there, no information, nothing. And today we have more than two months talking about Shanghai. What goes on there, nobody knows. And what is uh, what is the impact for the economy? Everybody can understand. Today we are living the third year of China not spending money in this planet. And this is very terrifying. Because, you know, uh, China cannot go uh, on spending just for uh, its own consumption. It is interlinked to our economy and so does uh, Russia, so does America and so on. So we, have, we are facing too many risks now. And uh, during the Pax Americana, we were always thinking that everything is settled and everything is okay and everything will go on as long as we eat McDonald's. But this is not the case anymore. We are having severe problems. We are having uh, no plan B. No plan B because for all these years, everybody was thinking that America will be the, the leader and uh, will uh, continue be, being like this. I can see that uh, the world as we knew it till uh, two years ago, it's over. And after the pandemic, everybody will try to, uh, to change, if, uh, if possible, the Yalta um, Pact and uh, they will go for something else. I, I understand that the Cold War is here, but this is not just uh, it. I can see poverty coming. I can see people uh, from the middle class losing all their privileges and benefits. I can see no so social security system. I can see too many things that are pessimistic. At the, at the same time, I can see that many people are struggling for survival. So you, you, you cannot blame them, you know. It is, a, it is a game of survival now. So um, I, I, I really believe that there are too many things that we can do and uh, I can come back to uh, a solution uh, in a short time. So please be with us. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs> okay, thank thank you. you. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Gary Whitehill, uh, Chairman of Geo Strategic Holdings from the U.S. Thanks, Francis. There's there's some great comments, and I'm going to take two separate statements from two of the gentlemen and just say it. We're in survival mode, and nobody has a plan. Uh, that's the best way you can you can really surmise where the world is right now and where we're going. You know, from a 250,000 foot level, um, far above any single corporation or any single government, the 
the facts that folks don't want to talk about and where they don't want to keep their perspective right now because we're down in the tactical level and we're down at uh, a level that is reactionary is the fact that uh, what we find in America and in the world in general is for the first time in human history, there's three cycles that are simultaneously compounding and reinforcing. And we're all at the last stage of these three cycles. We're at the last stage of capitalism, which is financialization. We're at the last stage of empire, which is collapse. And we're at the last stage of democracy, which is apathy. So when you take those three macro level cycles that you can't change, that you're stuck in and that are going to continue as a combined tsunami going forward, that's how you're in survival mode and, and nobody has a plan because every country is militarily unready, technologically unfit and institutionally blind to what that actually means socially, politically, economically, militarily, judicially, you name it. So that's how we get into an, an environment and a situation in, in corporations and in institutions inside of governments where the volatile, uncertain, chaotic and ambiguous and not all events that, that we're seeing are just getting started. Right. The, the 2020s is not a stable time period. The 2020s is much like the 1930s uh, and also much like the, the, the 1910s combined in a very uh, weird, twisted and, and, and contorted way. And uh, somebody had said, I think it was Sandro talking about an administrative mindset in the military and in the intelligence world. And that's the same also in these big corporations who, uh, for the most part, don't create value anymore. They manufacture value. Right. It's financialization in in public markets and those finance and that financialization. What that has ultimately done is it's ripped apart our institutions. It's hollowed out all of our institutions, whether those are social and civic institutions or their political institutions and some of the economic institutions. Uh, and so also when when uh, talking about some of the gaps that we're seeing, war in the 21st century is mental, emotional and economic. It's not it's not physical. Um, overall, those are not the rules of war in the 21st century. Uh, Ukraine is, is an exception, but that has to do with a very long thousand year history of, of why those certain things are happening and who certain presidents are in certain countries where there's fundamental weakness and then the window was uh, best suited for now to do something like that. Uh, one, of the other, one of the other challenges we're all facing when it comes to you know, war being digital is you have, in, in, at least in America's mindset, in, in Europe is doing a better job at it with GDPR, you have Wall Street marrying itself with uh, Silicon Valley. And what their whole scheme has been for the past decade is to roll up eyeballs at a click of a button and to exploit the human population for profit on purpose to make rich people richer. Uh, so instead of making a stronger, more diverse and a better country, uh, even though it's an empire, it's not a country, uh, what we've done is the diametric opposite of that. And so the systemic repercussions of, frankly, being naive to the point thinking that Americans can, at the click of a button, be hacked mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and chemically, uh, and we're still going to have a strong united nation of states, is a fallacy. In fact, what we have and what will continue to emerge, somebody had spoken about China, um, where we're moving into is 21st century digital communism. So take Hitler, take Stalin, take Mussolini, take Tito, you know, multiply them by about a million X. And that's ultimately the dystopia we'll be in in the next 10 years. So that's where we already are when you look at the rails of the technological totalitarianism, uh, the digital censorship. These are just the same tools that every uh, great dictator, every great authoritarian has uh with precision, understood how to execute and now implement on 5G pipes, soon 6G pipes, and you want to start to talk about quantum computing and these things, the, the first world nations are way behind for the most part uh, in terms of quantum. And last but not least, the, the, the thing we also need to understand, the last gentleman talked about poverty and some of the systemic repercussions is, you know, in my opinion, what I see happening, particularly in the United States, which will have compounding effects to the security in Europe and particularly in the place I spend the most time is Africa, is the United States is going to balkanize, it's going to fracture, it's going to look more like Europe and, you know, the window for kind of this uh, digital, digital slash mental, emotional and somewhat physical civil war, the window for that's roughly 2026 to 2028. I know that's a lot of negative, that's a lot of compounding and 
systemic things that aren't very happy. But I think here we have an obligation as leaders and as experts to talk about the real problems in an authentic way. So at least certain, uh, you know, folks can have perspective on what's really going on versus the administrative way of just pushing the ball forward in an incremental way. Because when you push the ball forward in an incremental way in a volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous environment, you actually create the opposite of your original intention. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, So certainly a very broad uh, and very detailed overview uh, that we have seen from our panelists about the the nature and the complexity of uh, of geopolitical risk that the world is facing today. It doesn't look like a very optimistic picture for sure. Certainly when we have seen, when we have heard, you know, how unprepared we are, how complacent the world has become because of that deep peace that has prevailed after World War II. So we didn't spend enough time or energy or for that matter money to to prepare for what uh, what could go wrong. And I think we have seen a lot of that in, in recent uh, years, certainly, um, whether it's you know, the COVID-19 and the Russian invasion of Ukraine have highlighted the, uh, the, those weaknesses, uh, whether it's with regard to the globalization of the supply chains and disruptions thereof, the reliance on some countries for critical resources and components like the, the ship shortage that we're seeing today and how countries are scrambling to, to build up their own um, manufacturing capacity to uh, cut that reliance on China for that matter. Um, I'm also struck by um, this, this notion of, uh, and this is maybe one of the things that I would also contribute to the, the geopolitical tensions, the, really the rise of, uh, of populism and nationalism um, and how that is even compounded by the impact and the influence of social media these days, where people can uh, really ignite uh, fires of, of, uh, of ethnic nationalism at times, and how that is not really being checked as much as it could be. A lot of those social media platforms, they're really, uh, whether they, they want you or not, they're sort of enablers of, of some of that uh, instability at times. And uh, if you look at even a country like the United States, uh, where I'm located, where you see the, uh, the impact of that social media has a disinformation campaign that we have seen uh, through social media, uh, how people latch onto some ideas and they run with it, and it can have destabilizing consequences. The, the balkanization uh, that uh, I think Gary had mentioned, uh, that, that is a prospect in the United States, uh, the deep polarization that we're seeing, not just in, uh, in the U.S., but certainly also in, in parts of, of Europe, I think that is um, a, um, you know, an added fact that needs to be taken into account. And then it gets back to the question of, yes, how can we actually address these geopolitical risks? Um, as, um, as an academic, I would say part of it also has to do with, you know, can we prepare the future generations to actually see the bigger picture rather than to borrow um, uh, one uh, comment, I forgot who mentioned this, that we're thinking more, more tactically, uh, but we don't see the bigger picture. Um, do we have uh, an approach where we can tell the future generations, you need to look at the broader world, you need to see the interconnections, the good, the bad, and the ugly, where are the vulnerabilities, how can we manage it, how can we actually instill in people a broader understanding and appreciation for the complexities of the world that we're living in. Um, I see that missing in, in a lot of the young generation as well, where they're truly apathetic, they don't care about what's happening around the world. And if and then when something like the Russian invasion happens, um, when we have militaries that are no longer prepared to sort of deal with it, and they're thinking more administrative terms, as, as one of you mentioned, I think that is one of the biggest weaknesses that we're seeing. So we're always more reactive than uh, you know proactive. And it brings me back to uh, one uh, a quote from a book uh, that talked about uh, sort of how Japan... The Japanese economic miracle sort of unraveled. There was a book called Japan, the System That Soured, and the author of that book had a very interesting line in there that where he said that, well, what Japan did was engage in symptomatic treatment when what was needed was to engage in radical surgery. And I think in a lot of ways, when we look at geopolitical tensions or geopolitical risks these days, we try to engage in patchwork, uh, sort of, well, there's a crisis, well, we patch it up a little bit, but we never see the broader connections. Uh, and that, I think, is, uh, is uh, what is also sort of missing, because the, the other geopolitical, the emerging geopolitical tension that may very well be on the horizon, some people have talked about, call it a, uh, an alliance of sorts, if you will, maybe an alliance of convenience in the short term, whether it will be an alliance in the long term, who knows, but the, the gradual rapprochement between Russia, 
and China as a result of the geopolitical tension that, that, that we have seen, where the U.S. is trying to curtail the rise of China, uh, the West is now uh, ganging up on, on Russia. Are we pushing them into an alliance of sorts? And what does that do for broader geopolitical tensions uh, going forward? Uh, so those are you know, some other themes or topics that, uh, that I could think of. I don't know if anybody wants to uh, talk a little bit about any of those. Uh, if, if not, uh, we can certainly also open it up to our uh, um, members in the audience here. But I want to give uh, maybe uh, the panelists uh, an opportunity to sort of react to, uh, to comments that were already made. Maybe about five minutes, and then we can shift to our um, members in the audience if they have any questions. Yes, Sandra? One volunteers. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're spot on on one very important thing, um, and that's complexity. Um, so I've, I've uh, witnessed in the work that we did and that I did over the last 15, 20 years in cyber and in intelligence that um, complexity really is a huge problem and, and nobody really understands it. I still remember one, one meeting we had among insurance experts, MIT people, um, uh, intelligence professionals, uh, where we all admitted to each other that we all may probably uh, each of us understands only 30% of the problem that we were facing in, in cyber operations. And it's too complex to really understand uh, the larger, the bigger picture. And um, there are a lot of factors on, on why that is the case. Uh, one important factor is uh, coming back to being informed. So we don't even know all the basics. Uh, there's, there were, were surprising intelligence gaps, for example, uh, now in uh, just before the Ukraine invasion, uh, surprising misconceptions about what would happen. Everybody globally, including the Russians and China, were certain that Ukraine would fall within 72 hours. They were all wrong. Um, and, and, uh, the, the, and there's also a lot of noise in, in these systems of knowledge generation. So it's, it's quite funny that we think we live in this in, incredibly informed, data-driven knowledge society, but at the same time, actually, what actually happens is that we're so overwhelmed with the complexity that we created that we're not c coming to the right conclusions anymore. So it's, it's actually the opposite has happened. Um, uh, we're no longer the knowledge society. We're the unknowledge society because we have too much information, too much data, and it's too hard for us to sort everything out. And that's something that's uh, coming very clear and, and very present. And another thing uh, was something that I found very interesting uh, to discuss as well, something Nicholas has mentioned, uh, and, and that's the, the low probability, high impact events. Um, so those are certainly an option, you know, and we, and, and, but they're politically not so very popular because you cannot tell your population that you're spending billions on an event that has a 1% probability, um, but it may kill your entire population. Um, so everybody would say, why are you spending billions? My kids need to go to school, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we're seeing now we've been hit by two low probability high impact events now in, in, in very short succession. And it's quite disruptive uh, to, to our systems. So these, these are, I think it's what we need to try to wrap our minds around is that um, we have to acknowledge that we're not good at mastering complexity, that we have too much complexity. And that we're not not really a knowledgeable society in in many ways. We're not good at at least I can tell you from my field that um, uh, all the intelligence entities where everybody thinks they know everything in, in fifteen years ahead, um, they were all some some are better than others and some some got some parts right but nobody got the picture right. So. Um, we're not any better at, at this. And this is, um, given the high stakes and the high risks that we're facing with uh, many of the things we created and many of the other things that we're confronted with now, like climate change, um, that is a very dangerous situation that we've been in. And I think the first step to solve that problem, actually, is to acknowledge that we're not good at managing complexity and then try to move from there. I always tell my militaries, um, uh, they, they, they have this funny attitude that they... Um, that they don't really want to acknowledge um, that they're not capable of doing what they have to do, that they're not capable of hiring hackers, they're not capable of um, uh, um, of buying good technology rapidly. 
And then they're, they're trying to solve their problem, and then they're stuck in trying to solve that problem for 20 years. So I tell them at some point, you just have to acknowledge that you're not able to solve the problem and then move on from there. Thank you. Anybody else would uh, like to chime in before I uh, give uh, our audience members an opportunity to ask questions as well? Yeah, I'm going to take a shot on, on, the, on the, the bottom end of, of everything we've talked about, Francis, which is, you know, when we talk about polarization and nationalism and, and some of these things, what I find fascinating is, frankly, the weakness and the cowardice of, of politicians these days. And, and in my uh, humble opinion, for the most part, mostly anti-leaders, it's very easy to demonize a population talking about populism and nationalism and these things. But human beings subconsciously are not stupid. Human beings understand that we are in a very structurally defunct time. You know, we're not in just a recession. We're in an economic depression, and we have been since 2008. It's just been masked over. Um, lots of quantitative easing has allowed that to continue. And 2020, once again, uh, that's why we have inflation, and inflation isn't just 8 or 10%, just like unemployment is not 2 or 10% either. And so what I find uh, unfortunate and also fascinating is how we're starting to see leaders push back against supposedly um, extremist groups, whether that's in, in Europe, uh, in especially now in the U.S. where it's white nationalism. And, you know, five years ago before it was uh, about, uh, you know, ideology and Muslims, and now it's magically about white nationalism. And all of a sudden, everybody, you know, says we have this new threat vector of extremism. Well, in reality, the extremism is the system itself. Uh, and I find it very disheartening and very disingenuous that it's very politically expedient for these anti-leaders to blame citizens instead of themselves and instead of the systems. And to, uh, I think, the point that was just made and acknowledge the institutional degradation that we've had and acknowledge the fact that we are systemically unhealthy. And that to your point, Francis, right now we need uh, radical surgery, not just symptoms, uh, because a lot of these high impact, low probability events that's what a volatile, uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous environment boils up more than the small, you know, threat vector things that we're used to. Thanks. Thank you. Well, since we have uh, just about three or four minutes left, um, I want to give our audience members uh, the opportunity to ask questions if they have any. So uh, uh, if any of you would like uh, to ask a question, just uh, use the, the mic function, grab the mic and uh, feel free to um to ask any questions to our panelists. Any question? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, um, maybe then I'll, I'll, I'll briefly give everybody an opportunity to um, about 45 seconds, just a um, a very quick sort of uh, one point that you would want to make about how wh how we would uh, how we should move forward from here in terms of geopo managing or um, mitigating geopolitical risk. A very succinct doesn't have to be a comprehensive answer, but uh, the most important thing that you would suggest to, to clients, to, to companies, to CEOs, and so on. And we can yeah. start with uh, Thomas, maybe. I th I think Dimos Tennis wanted to take the floor first. Okay, my, if I may, yes. Okay, thank you. So, you know, uh, uh, there is something that it is called instinct. Okay, so if uh, if your feelings about the reality are bad or good and whatever it is, please try to trust yourself. Meaning, this is the the first thing that I have learned. Two years ago, the Valentine's Day, it was the wedding anniversary of, of, our, of my wife and, my, and I. And uh, we were sitting on a sofa drinking champagne. And I told her, look, now is the end of uh, the, the world economy. It was just before, you know, everything collapses. You know, we have to start be sensible and be open to what goes on next to us and start understanding what goes on and once you are you can understand what goes on you have to adapt yourself chameleon i believe is the best uh, uh, paradigm for us it is an animal that will survive except if it uh, has a, a human being next to it okay so 
Thank you for this. Uh, Thank meeting. you. <laughs> Thomas? Yeah, no, I, 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 c coming back to to the main theme of the discussion that was mentioned by, by I think, all the speakers, what is important for, for corporations and, and individuals and, and governments is to have the humility to acknowledge uh, what we know that we don't know. And I think this, this is the most important issue uh, uh, that can help us navigate uh, geopolitical risk and troubled waters. And the big danger is to think that we know when actually we don't know. And I think there's, there's no shame in acknowledging uh, uh, incompetence and lack of understanding of a complex situation. Uh, but it's very dangerous to pretend that we know something and that we are actually going at high speed right into the wall. So that would just be my, my message. All right, thank you. Uh, Nicholas? Yeah, I'll just echo what Thomas was saying. I think the greatest danger lies in our blind spots. And um, I, I raised three potential blind spots. I think we need to be very careful of those um, low probability, high impact events. Um, as, as Sandro put it quite nicely, um, you often don't see them coming until they, they hit you right in the face. Um, and I think secondly as well, the exposure to certain recklessness in the cryptocurrency markets, um, the financial exposure there, I think we need to be very cautious about. Um, and, and finally, the, the rising interest rate environment, uh, which is sort of inevitable due to the inflationary pressures. Uh, I think people underestimate the effect that's going to have on the global economy. Thank you. Uh, Gary? Yeah, from a structural perspective, the one action step I would uh, recommend is that we rebuild the core mission of corporate boards. Until we do that, you know, boards are so focused on compliance and uh, spend about 80 percent of their time with regulations versus looking at the strategic foresight um, and some of the risk vectors that we're talking about. You know, corporations have become so interlinked and so now imbued with some civic and social purpose. Uh, that they're not just about maximizing profit anymore, whether that's good or bad is outside the context of this core, uh, conversation. But unless we rebuild the, the, the core mission of boards, um, a lot of what we've talked about, for instance, here today would get devolved into the bottom side of a risk committee in a corporate board instead of what we're talking about be the core mission of the board. Um, and that, once again, makes a corporation unready unready, unfit, and blind. And when you have a corporation that is not just building products and services, but is also funding educational initiatives for their employees, now, you know, building out communities and, and these types of systemic ways that corporations are kind of expanding their tentacles, it is really uh, a large risk that uh, a corporation is focused on compliance and status quo versus rebuilding its core mission around geostrategic future, futures and understanding how they can play a core component in making the world a safer, secure, and more stable place. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra? Yeah, very much agree with everything that has been said. Um, so not much to add. I would probably say don't rely on others to understand your problems for you. You have to understand your problems yourself. Um, but I think uh, the, the, this year is a little bubble with people who are risk aware and who know uh, that risk management is important. Um, the, the, the more uh, the hard part will be to get us out of our bubble and the bubble around the people who actually should have the bubble. But I have no solution to that. Then I would be very rich. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. I think you had uh, very good answers. I wish we could have a, a much longer discussion because this is certainly a very broad topic that would deserve a lot more attention. Um, you all brought very interesting points uh, to the table, food for thought, that hopefully we all can go back and reflect on a little bit more. Um, and personally, I can also hope that you know we can stay in touch and, and maybe carry on the discussion um, in, in, in private as well. But uh, I thank you all very much for taking the time to uh, joining us on this uh, panel. Um, and um, I wish you all the best going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Um, I can suggest just before we log off, there's this group fee feature where we can take a group selfie while we're all here. Sure. Yeah. How are we going to do this?
Well, why don't we ask our moderator, Francis, to take a picture? Yeah, I did the, take a couple of screenshots. I don't know if there's another feature like on the platform here that I'm not aware of. Um, uh, yeah, so just down at the is. bottom, there's like the six boxes and right in the middle is a virtual group fee. So I'll start it. Oh, I'll take a photo. Okay. Good. Are, are good. you taking one, Nicholas? Yes, I'm, I'm taking one. Okay. Uh, so if everyone clicks that button, you can all um, take a selfie. Oh, I see it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So four people are finished. Yeah, I didn't do. I I, I found it and I lost it. <laughs> oh. uh. Yeah. Yeah. Hack it. Hack it. The bottom. Right next to the cocktail party. Uh, on the left? On the left. And if you click that and then in the middle. Is it group file? That's right. Yep. Ah, okay. 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 Well, it's okay. Forget about me. I will not take a selfie. <laughs> Thank you, well, guys. I took a few screenshots as well, so I can uh, share those. Uh, well, I'll put them on, on LinkedIn as well, so you can uh, retrieve them there if you'd like. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.